All right. Last week, we looked at focused on faith. This morning, it's going to be the fruit of faith. Lord willing, next week, faith for the family, and then beyond that, faith for the future. I pray that we come to this and, and please, by God's grace, recognize this. This is not brag. It's, it's God's word. Time and again, when we open the Bible, you remember the, the God of the universe that was created? Brad is right. That's the God that indwells us. That's the God that loved us so much. Amen? When we open up the word of that God, it can speak volumes to us. The Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit is here and can open our eyes. And I'm not saying this, just th this is not me. But honestly, this is one of those messages as I've studied, I've thought, oh my soul. If we, if we embrace this, if we assimilate it into our lives, it will change us. Now, I know the wicked one doesn't want a message like this, but God does. I honestly thought about this. And by the way, I'm not saying don't listen now, but if you want my notes, you're welcome to them. I'll print, I was going to print out the notes to everybody and say, just, you know, follow along not going to do that. But can we at least, by God's grace, give him our hearts and minds right now for the next 45 minutes and listen to what he has to say? Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I have prayed for this moment. I ask that by your grace, you will indeed speak to us. Lord, may there be a difference that is made because we have grasped truth that has been expanded, that maybe has been acknowledged for the first time. Lord, I pray that this would make a difference. We so rejoice in what faith does when it comes to coming to Christ and saving us but that indeed is just the beginning. Lord, speak. Your servants here. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bibles, and we're going to be speak, we're going to be beginning at a familiar passage, but there's depth here that we need to go into even more. Go to Hebrews chapter eleven. This uh, this last week. There was a, quite honestly, a godless congressman by the name of Jerry Nadler out of New York. He spoke truth and he didn't know it. There was a representative, I believe the name is pronounced Greg Stubbe, from Florida. He, in the words of someone, triggered a bunch of God haters when he pointed out that God makes people uniquely male and female. Amen? It's insane. The insanity is unbelievable. And that's what this Equality Act is all about, tossing out in a major way what thus saith the Lord really means. This congressman from Florida said this, speaking of the legislation that is now going to the Senate. The gender confusion that exists in our culture today is a clear rejection of God's good design. Whenever a nation's laws no longer reflect the standards of God, that nation, that nation is in rebellion against him and will inevitably bear 
the consequences, and he's right. We are seeing the consequences of rejecting God here in our country today. Nadler's response was this, quote, What any religious tradition describes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. And for most of the people that were there, he was right. He spoke truth. Our nation is in desperate need of believers. Not just people trusting Christ as Savior, but it's in desperate need of believers looking the world, looking people like that in the eye and declaring this, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. In other words, we need the fruit of faith. The fruit of true biblical faith. A.W. Tozer observed this, quote, Contemporary Christians have been caught in the spurious logic that those who have found him need no longer seek him. Nothing could be further from the truth. The paradox of the Christian faith is that those who know him are those who seek him. Come near to the holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. Remember what we were talking about in Sunday school, burning hearts or blinded eyes. They mourned for him. They prayed and wrestled and sought for him day and night, in season and out. And when they found him, the finding was all the sweeter for the long seeking. Please remember that last phrase and the gist of it. Now go to, again, Hebrews chapter 11. A familiar passage, but there's a reason we're going back to it. Verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, preacher, we've studied that before. What about it? Please hang with me. The word substance, again, may, is made up of two Greek words that mean that which stands under, a foundation. Faith is to a Christian a foundation. Remember that. It gives confidence and assurance that he will stand. When a believer has faith, it is God's way of giving him confidence and assurance that what is promised will be experienced. Does God give promises? Does he? Do you have a favorite promise of God? If you do, raise your hand. My hand is up. God gave the promise. Faith assures you God will keep the promise. Let's move on. This word, this term, when it comes to faith, faith is the confidence of of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He's, it means this. It stands for the whole body of documents bearing on the ownership of a person's property. Literally, faith is the title deed of things hoped for, which bleeds into this, the evidence, simply the conviction of things not seen. This is the inward conviction from God. It's not a feeling that we create, but what the Holy Spirit of God does, does in us. The inward conviction from God that what he has promised, he will perform. In other words, in God's word, folks, when God created the universe, I love what Jim Berg said here, he created his universe to rotate around his promises. When he gives you that faith, when he brings the conviction, 
you know he will keep it. When he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, we can bank on this. He will never leave us or forsake us. No matter how bad the culture gets. No matter how bad. Now, go back if you would please to verse 2. For by it the elders obtained a good report. This is interesting. The Greek word that translates their witness and good report is an important word there. It occurs in verse 2. I didn't read it here in verse 4, but it occurs twice in verse 4, once in verse 5, and once in verse 39. In verse 2, the words obtained a good report, and again, witness, are the translation of a Greek word that means to bear witness to, but it's in the passive voice. It literally says, for by it the elders were born witness to. Please hang in with me there. God bore witness to him, excuse me, to them. Our God actively bore witness to them and hence is bearing witness to us that their faith gained victory for them over all obstacles. Read 2021. It is not enough to believe in the right God. The devils believe also, we learned last week, and tremble. Many Jews to whom the letter of Hebrews was addressed acknowledged the true God, the God of the Scripture, but they did not have faith in him. They didn't trust him. That's the reason why one of the first, one of the first evidences they were given was Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Now watch this. Faith works with the eyes of the mind. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust his word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are or what the consequences may be. The circumstances may be impossible and the consequences may be even frightening and unknown, but we obey God's word just the same and believe him to do what is right and what is best. Remember the three Hebrew children. The unsaved world does not understand true Bible faith. That congressman doesn't, and a lot of people in this capital don't, but the challenge is when God's people haven't studied it out. They haven't gleaned the fruit of faith. They have faith. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. They're reading their Bible. But there's fruit that we can get. The unsaved world doesn't understand true Bible faith. And sadly, I think it might be because they see so little of it in action in local churches today. There was a cynic by the name of H.L. Mencken. He, in his pompousness, said, I can define faith. It is an illogical belief in the occurrence of the impossible. The world fails to realize something. Faith is only as good as its object. Remember, we don't put faith in faith. We have faith in... That's the object of our faith. He is the object. The object of our faith is God. Again, hold on to that. Faith is not a feeling that we manufacture. It is a response to what God has revealed in his word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And we hear that and we go, wow, that's really something. But then minds begin to create machines and mechanisms that can look into that. And then we wind up seeing a video like we saw earlier. Brad, that was great timing. And it's like, wow, when God created, he spoke and it was done? Yes, that's what the Bible says. Well, for somebody to have that kind of power, they've got to be some kind of God. Amen, amen. It is our total response to what God has revealed in his word. Now, look at verse six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. See, he's already talked about here. He talks about Abel and he talks about Enoch. And I'm gonna be mentioning something about Enoch in just a little bit. But then in verse six, he stops. He stops the genealogy, as it were, of faith. He stops the, the, the faith hall of fame and he says this, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, please, I am begging you, stay with me. It is possible to do something for God and not please him. Let that sink in. Our flesh immediately wants to jump in and help out God. He says, no, to please the Lord, it must be done by faith, period. But without, without Greek word, meaning apart from faith, destitute of faith. It is impossible to please him. That literally means it's impossible to please God at all. He's not going to go, well, I appreciate your efforts. No, he says, that's not what I want. Without faith, it is impossible. You cannot please God. What he wants in you is not your good works. He wants his good works in you. Amen? Amen? There's more. There's more. Natural ability and works done before the grace of Christ are not pleasant to God. They're not. They don't spring out of faith. That's why even the plowing of the wicked is sin. Plowing can be a good thing. It's used to plant crops. People eat because of that. But the wicked in doing that do not please God. He wants what we do. He wants it done through him. He that cometh to God is a worshiper. So here is a worshiper. He says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God as a worshiper must believe, once and for all, must believe that God is. Here's where we start getting into some interesting words. He is the true self-existing Jehovah. As in, he is not Baal. He is not any of the other false gods of any, of, of any civilization, any culture. So here's Enoch. What this passage implies, what he's trying to do and trying to get the Hebrews who read this to listen, and we need to understand this as well. Enoch, it implies that he had not been favored with visible appearances of God, yet he believed in God's being. Enoch did not believe in God because God showed himself to him one day physically, Enoch believed God because one way or another, he believed that which God had given already that revealed him. He believed in God's being and in God's moral government as the rewarder of his diligent worshipers. Not just a belief that stays static, but listen, a belief that changes the life. 
It is something that because we believe in God, Enoch, it says, he walked with God. That was communion. God, whatever you want, that's what I want. Wherever you take me, that's where I'll go. And is. Now watch this. Okay, must believe that God is and that he is. The first word that translates is, is the translation of the Greek word which simply means existence. Okay, believe that he is. He is what? He's God. He's the self-existent one. Are you with me so far? All right, listen. The second verb that translates is, it's the idea of this. The idea is not merely that God exists as a rewarder, but that he will prove himself to be a rewarder of that person who diligently seeks him. Now you've got to stay with me. God is looking in this auditorium right now, and he is saying, if you will diligently seek me, I will reward that. Let that sink in. What's my Christian life? Well, every Sunday I got to go to church. And the preacher says I got to read my Bible and I got to pray. So, you know, I'll do what the song says, you know, read at least a chapter every day. That's all I'm going to read. No. Enoch was given as a testimony to the Jewish people, you seek me out and there's reward. Enoch walked with God and was not. Pow! Why? Because God took him. Why? I've heard stories like this. You know, God says, you know, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to yours. Why don't you come home with me tonight? That's not, I mean, it's cute, but that's not the reason. He did it as a testimony that God will do in his infinite will anything to show his children, you're mine, I love you, and this is the power that I have, and this is the reward I give to anybody that is diligently seeking me. It starts in salvation. Folks, there's coming a time he's going to take us home. Pow! Except it's not going to be pow, it's going to be a trumpet. But he will do that. You know why? He's a rewarder, even in this life. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, we're going to be going to some other passages, but we can't lose this. What this world needs to see today is the fruit of faith. What is that fruit? We're going to be beginning to see this. It's the result in God's people, the testimony that we have before a lost and dying world that is akin to what God has done in so many lives that shows that he is a rewarder, no matter what it is. How does he reward? With the three Hebrew children, he rewarded them by having them not burn in the fiery furnace. There's others, they've gone through, some th th through things. But in each place, when a person diligently seeks God, God will reward him. Stop and consider it. Draw nigh to God, and he will do what? Draw nigh to you. So he is a rewarder, literally a renderer, renderer of reward. That's what he did with Enoch. The reward is God himself. God himself. You know, we get this idea. You know, we get up to heaven, 
And it's like, great, you know, we've gotten reward. Where do we spend it? Is there a heavenly Walmart? Praise God, no. He's the reward. There is a relationship, as we will soon see, there is a relationship that is an incredible joy. I don't want to get ahead of myself. He's a rewarder of them and only them who diligently seek him. The, word, the phrase diligently seek literally means seek him out. We don't, just, we, we don't just hear about God and it's like, wow, that's cool. See you, preacher. I've got things I've got to do. You see, the change comes when there are souls, when there are hearts in this auditorium right now that determine, you know what? I'm going to be like Paul, that I may know him. Oh, I, I can't be like Paul. No, we, we're, we're not Paul, but you know what we are? We're believers just like Paul. And he's telling us this to teach us this. Now, I want to show you something. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. In studying this, it was like, oh, my soul, I see it. Isn't it amazing how we wind up getting into scriptures and it's, you know, it's familiar territory, but we wind up drilling a little deeper because you get to thinking and you read a couple of guys, but you get to thinking and it's like, wow, I, I see that. Okay, familiar passage, but again, please bear with me. There are things here we need to see. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, whoa, wait a minute. You know how many times I have read that passage and I've just kept right on going? This is so incredibly key. Think of everything that was affected when Satan whispered subtly, Ye hath God said. How much was now in play? How much now was being ever so subtly destroyed? What is the title of our message? The fruit of what? Can I ask you something? Did Adam and Eve have faith? It was, I mean, it was there like the air we breathe. God is there. I mean, they literally, I mean, God came down and walked with them. There was their creator. And Satan comes in and he uses something that will help hook them and just grab them and pull the trigger. He doesn't come down and go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to poison the water. He doesn't come down and get on a, on, on a hillside and go, you know, you're so stupid believing in God, I'm telling you. He doesn't do that. He doesn't come and go, hey, watch what I can do. I can juggle 47,000 47, things at once. Why don't you follow me? He doesn't do that. He ever so subtly goes after that thing that once it's attacked and the attack winds up bearing fruit, once it's gone, oh my soul, what has taken place. And that is the trusting relationship of mankind with his creator. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And then she responds. And his response is, ye shall not surely die. Now you remember what Satan, in looking through an individual, in fact, a couple of times this has happened in Scripture, 
we have seen through, God has made sure we've been able to see through to the character of the wicked one himself. And this is shared in Isaiah 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, verse 13, Isaiah 14, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Let me ask you something. If suddenly you don't have a God that you can trust, who becomes your God? I guess I'm going to have to trust myself. I will be like the Most High. You see what happens here? Before he can do anything, he must first destroy something that was the natural bond in the relationship of God and they who were created in his image. That word, pistis, verb form pistuo, translates three ways in our New Testament. Faith, trust, belief. And that's what he needed to come in and destroy. That's why all he did was come in and ask an insidious question. Yea, hath God said. And he hooked him. He hooked us, because we would have sinned the same way if we were there, when he said, ye shall not surely die. And so again, remember, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And when the woman saw the tree, it was good for food, pleasant of the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise. She took it, she ate it, and he took and did it as well. But now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is there a way back? Watch this. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 13. This is a verse that we commonly use in giving the gospel to somebody. This is oftentimes where we end, where we read Romans 10 verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. (laughs) And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. But let's keep going. How then shall they call upon him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know what he's been talking about there? Faith. Watch this, verse 15. Speaking of the preacher of it all, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring uh, glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Watch this, verse 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We saw how faith was destroyed. Now we're going to start seeing how faith once again bears fruit. This is what happens. Literally here, that verse says this. Faith is out of the source of that which is heard. The gospel is preached in the power of the Holy Spirit and it produces the faith needed to believe it. The same God that spoke, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He is the same God that said, for God so loved the world. He was true in the first And he's true in the second. 
See, what begins to take place here is this. There was a God that spoke in Genesis. Don't eat of the fruit. Here comes the wicked one. Ye shall not surely die. And man is separated. But now the same God who has spoken in the Old Testament and now he has spoken to us through his son, the spoken word brings up, what is it? Faith. And that faith then begins to bear fruit. What happens? Mark chapter 1. Now after that John was put in prison, I came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time was fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now this is what we read again and again and again. Jesus takes us right to what was lost in the garden. Faith, trust, belief. Mark eleven twenty two, 22. And I, answered, say, and I answering saith unto them, have faith in God. And the apostle saith unto the Lord, increase our faith. And he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Romans 1, 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And we might even respond like the man did to Christ in Mark 9, 24. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And from this point on, we can have a faith that changes us, a passion. What was the fruit of the faith? The fruit of the faith which is given to us through Christ means, and I want to give three points very quickly, and I'm done. Number one, we can receive what justifies. Receive what justifies. Romans 3, verse 28, there were, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Two verses later in Romans 3, seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Means basically the same thing. Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the very first thing, here comes that faith. It was destroyed in Genesis 3. Now there are their own God. But Jesus comes. Oh, the, the sacrifices looking ahead to Christ, they come, but now Jesus comes. And now, by grace are you saved through faith. That faith, that trust comes again. Now watch this. The first thing it does, it justifies. That's the fruit. But secondly, write this down. It satisfies. Adam and Eve ate the fruit because they saw something that was pleasant to the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise, etc. Now, we as Christians, followers of Christ, are now satisfied with God himself. I like what Jim Berg put together one day. He says, you know, today will be a good day. Do you like having a good day? Today will be a good day, he said, because number one, God is with me as he promised. He will meet my every genuine need. I can fellowship with him at a moment's notice. He will show his love and grace. He will be more than enough for me today. That's God. That's satisfaction. We need nothing else except God. I'm reading in the book of Psalms. I was sharing in Sunday school. I'm reading in the book of Psalms most of this last week. 
Boy, I love the Psalms. And I'll never forget the one time I was reading Psalm 87, and I don't know why it was, but it was like, wow, the very last phrase in verse 7, it's the last verse of the, of the Psalm, the very last phrase of Psalm 87, all my springs are in thee. And I wrote down, man, all my rest, hope, joy, peace, strength, wisdom, righteousness, everything. It's the same thing for you too. And all God's people said, Amen. listen to what Spurgeon said about this. Churches have not such all sufficiency within them that we can afford to look to them for all. But the Lord who founded the church is the eternal source of all our supplies. And looking to him, we shall never flag or fail. How truly does all our experience lead us to look to the Lord by faith and say, all my fresh springs are in thee. All of it. Thirdly, and lastly, we through that faith can receive what glorifies. Now remember this, worry and fear say, I have found something or someone that God cannot or will not handle in my life. That's an insult to his love, to his power, to his promises. Faith glorifies our heavenly father. It glorifies him. Remember Lazarus, John eleven four. 4. When Jesus heard that he had died, he said this, excuse me, he was sick. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Listen, the year 2020 was for one purpose and one purpose only, for the glory of God. But you know what some of us Christians, you know what we're doing? Oh man, I can't believe this stinks. It was for the glory of God. You know what the year 2021 is all about? And you know something? Whatever happens to the United States of America, it will be for the glory of God. Amen. We can trust that. We can believe that. And oh, by the way, we can rest in that. We can rest in it. Yeah, but what if we can rest in it? Yeah, but, but, but wait a minute. You know, all we need to do is look back in the Faith Hall of Fame. <laughs> hey, um, uh, Moses, remember when you were standing you know, in front of Pharaoh and it wasn't looking too promising? Could you trust him? Yeah. Hey, three Hebrew children. <laughs> I mean, you're standing there and they're going, make the flame seven times hotter. Can you spell the word toast? Now look, if we could get more passionate about God rather than being passionate about Fox News or Newsmax, or any place else, or whoever we wind up listening to, if we could get passionate about God, do you think he would reward? Every person makes a decision. Folks, the fruit of faith is God himself. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He is the reward. It changes the life. It changes us. John eleven forty, that same chapter, Jesus saith unto her, one of his sisters, Lazarus' sisters, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Lord, look what's happening to our nation. Listen, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see the glory of God?
But Lord, we ask you for this. I know you asked me. But said I not unto thee, if you would believe, you'll see the glory of God. I am your exceeding great reward. So we, never, we need to remember this, these things. Romans 8, what should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who will be against us? Psalm 18, for thou wilt lighten my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. He will help me see what's going on for his glory. I was going to read much more of this, but I'm not going to. But can I encourage you to do something? If you get an opportunity, there's a book I'd like to encourage you to get. I believe you can still get it. I don't know if it's being uh, published right now, but you can get it used and you can get it, I believe, on Kindle. It's called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. I believe it's written by his grandson, Hudson Taylor's grandson. You get that, and I guarantee you, by the time you get to the end of chapter 14, you are cloud nine and climbing. Here was a man who was a missionary, but he was struggling in his faith, living his faith out. And then he got a letter from a man who had been reading a little thin book entitled, Christ is All. And he wrote this. He said, this is what I think I've learned. And he wrote this to Hudson Taylor. Quote, The Lord Jesus received is holiness begun. The Lord Jesus cherished is holiness advancing. The Lord Jesus counted upon as never absent would be holiness complete. He is most holy who has most of Christ within and joys most fully in the finished work. It is defective faith which clogs the feet and causes many a fall. He goes on. Think about this. To let my loving Savior work in me His will, my sanctification is what I would live for by His grace. Abiding not striving nor struggling, looking off unto him, trusting him for present power, resting in the love of an almighty Savior and the joy of a complete salvation from all sin. This is not new, he said, yet tis new to me. Christ literally all seems to me now. The power the only power for service, the only ground for unchanging joy. How then to have our faith increased? Only by thinking of all that Jesus is and he is for us. His life, his death, his work. He himself as revealed to us in the word to be subject of our constant thoughts. Not a striving to have faith but a looking off to the faithful one seems all we need. A resting in the loved one entirely for time and eternity. Hudson Taylor wrote, when I read that, he said, I looked to Jesus and when I saw, oh, how joy flowed. It is my prayer that as long as God has us meeting together, as long as we are coming together and meeting, we are truly looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That we have a passion for him. In doing that, this local fellowship can be used of God because he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And that, friend, is the fruit of faith. So what are we going to do with it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, I'm so thankful that the folks hung in there. I'm so thankful that they have listened. Lord, I pray that you would help us to hear thee. Lord, I pray that we would make the right decision. Just very briefly, please, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not, once again, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I'm going to put this forth. How many of us this morning will walk out of this building with a desire, with a passion for the Savior? How many of us will determine that we're not going to look at Paul's statement that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, that we're not going to look at it as something that is foreign, but we are going to be more passionate for God than the wicked are passionate for their sin. That is the key. What we do with Christ from this point on is the key of what Christ will do with us as a local church. Lord, you know hearts. I love these folks. I'm so thankful for them. In the midst of all this, it's been so hard. Like Brother Alfred was mentioning, there are people that have dealt with this virus that has truly killed thousands. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us in this time that you knew about, that whatever distraction comes, we'll be looking to you passionately that we might be able to give a testimony and a testimony might be seen in us of the yearning for God and that it is our God that is the answer and the rewarder of that answer. Lord, I pray that this week you would help each and every one of my brothers and sisters here some struggling, some, Lord, difficulty in spiritual things and family things. I pray that you'd continue to guide us. Oh, Lord, do your work. Thank you for who you are. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.